I'm so tired of people saying that it's just a movie, it's just a comic book, it's just a TV show. What? No, it's not. Stories are the building blocks of our culture, of our of ourselves, even of our own psychology. We are a product of the stories we tell ourselves about our own past and the experiences on a daily basis, but also the stories that we choose to spend time with. What types of values, our feelings, or whatever are they promoting? What types that we like to spend our time around? They're going to shape us. They're going to shape our personality and character, and they're going to shape our perception of the world and the acts and behaviors that we put out into the world. And people don't understand that. They go, it's just a movie. It's just this. I can, I can like and promote whatever I want. Well, of course you can, but you should pay attention to the responsibility that you have. Assume stories responsibly. As a, as a member of society, as a human being, responsibility to yourself. Consider the consequences. You need some balance. You need, you need some certain criteria that is going to make sure you're promoting the right kind of work. So or at least have thought through the type of work that this or that story is going to do in our culture. And then make your own decision whether or not that's something you want to support. Assume stories responsibly. Consider the consequences. consequences. Assume stories responsibly. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another Office Hours. And I'm going to apologize right now in case there's some, some coughing, hacking, sniffing, or whatever. I think I've got a little bit of allergies going on. But uh, hopefully I'll try not to be too, too uh, disruptive for the stream there. But welcome, everyone. Hope you had a good week. Hope your uh, weekend is shaping up well. Hope your holiday season is shaping, shaping up well. Of course, we loved Halloween. Had a great Halloween. Of course, Sound Engraver and I had a wonderful wedding season leading right into Halloween. It was wonderful. But uh, Thanksgiving coming up. So hopefully you guys have some good plans or even just plans to relax. I know I am crazy looking forward to this week because universities take, well, some universities, some universities do it differently. But my schools take the whole week off. And even the, the tutoring I do on the side, uh, you know, is leveled down a lot. So I'm looking forward to some sleeping in, some uh, some extra free time to, to do some, some creative stuff and whatnot. So that'll be good. But welcome to the chat there. Uh, first up was Ghost Planet, Ghost Planet Max Inc. 6.57XO or whatever. <laughs> I never get your name right. You, know, you, you alter your name a little bit here and there. But you were first. So congratulations and, and welcome to you. Um, I can't remember who was next because I had to reset my chat and it kind of updated. But Eldritch fans, first one I see there, Eldritch fans mentions uh, a whole bunch of Star Wars Legends unabridged audiobooks are slated for release. That's awesome. Say Wraith Squadron, Iron Fist, uh, I Jedi, Survivor's Quest, Outbound Flight, Courtship of Princess Leia. That's so good to hear. I hadn't heard about that yet. I, I had been periodically checking in because Disney was releasing unabridged audio along with their new um eu legends banner you know books which were nonsense but they were releasing unabridged audio to accompany it for a while and it was great i was getting like x-wing you know books un unabridged and whatnot and then they they announced that they were going to release some with their next set uh dark rendezvous you know yoda dark rendezvous was going to be one of them and whatnot and they just didn't release the unabridged audio they released the new uh legends banner hard copy books but they didn't release the unabridged audio and it really it, quite frankly it really pissed me off because i think unabridged audio is just completely i'm sorry abridged audio is just completely unacceptable in today's day and age it's absolutely unacceptable it, you know it, it's i understand back in the day you books on tape and stuff maybe it's kind of cost prohibitive to do the whole thing even then though you could buy you used to see those big plastic cases with like you know eight cassettes in it or something that would have a whole book on it but you know what about the the, the visually impaired uh you know not every uh person who's visually impaired uses you know reads braille or whatever they they re rely on audio and whatnot and if these a lot of these books are only available in a bridged format that's just unacceptable you know as i said i love audio books for when i'm doing stuff that i can't sit i can't have an open book reading i think it's important to always have a hard copy book that you're reading at any given time you know that you're trying to get through you know at any given time but, you know, my commutes are things, times I'm doing work or whatever, and I just want to listen. You know, audiobooks are wonderful for that. And it's just so annoying when you, you search for a good classic book or a good cold Star Wars book and this stupid abridged audio, you know, comes on. So it was great to know that Disney was releasing that, but then they just stopped. And I just thought, 
par for the course. Disney doesn't really give a crap about, you know, anything that they didn't create. So um, and now in, in the chat, I'm seeing, I think, Andre Hernandez, somebody said it's like Del Rey might be taking it over. I, I'm literally just hearing about this right before I started the stream. So I don't I don't have any of the details, but it's really good news. And I hope that happens. If, if it's just announced today, I imagine it probably wouldn't be out until like April or something. I think that's usually how that's how they had been doing it with Disney with the announcements and whatnot. But really good news. We'll see. Uh, the Star Wars EU book studies are coming back in December. You know, I had to stop them there for the month of October because with the wedding and everything, it was just too much for me. And then I asked Al, asked Big Al when he wanted to bring them back. And he's kind of having fun doing some Friday uh, movie rewatches right now. So we thought uh, late, sep late December, late December. So next month, late December, about a month from now, we're going to bring those back. We haven't exactly decided on which one we're going to do yet. I think we might just because I've been wanting to kind of do this for a while anyway, um, do the Star Wars Dark Empire audio dramas, not technically books, but, you know, they're in comic book form. But Al needs an audio to go by. So we might do the audio dramas, which are pretty faithful and pretty comprehensive, you know, to the comic books themselves. And we can talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the book. I have very mixed feelings about the Dark Empire um, first one anyway. So we'll do that, but we can do all three because they're audio um, dramas, which you can find for free on YouTube, you know, just search for them. And they're really quite well done. And we can um, go from there, start there and then see what we want to um, go after that. So that's that's the current plan if it changes. But uh, back to welcoming folks. <laughs> Welcome Nathaniel Zalozball. Great to see you there. Just bought your ticket for Godzilla minus one. I did not know there was a Godzilla movie coming out. This is how out of touch I am. I'm just so unplugged from Hollywood's new offerings. And I love it. I love being that unplugged. Not to say that I'm not, you know, on board if something actually came out that ended up proving to be good. Um, I'll have to look into that because I did like the Godzilla uh, Kong, those monster movies that were there. Is it part of that that um, kind of monarch universe or is it a different one? You have to let me know. Big Al presents. Pop by just to say hi. Good to see you there. Darth Enigma, welcome. Alec Perdue, good to see you. Andre Hernandez, as I said. Mr. D-Man, 2021, Final Fantasy fan. So many more. Leia Plus Size, got a new uh, new thumbnail there. And of course, my dear sweet wife, Sound Engraver. My dear Mrs. Professor Geek. Uh, ready to hear your wise words, my prof. Um, Jack Hammer City said, what's up? Did you hear about the Scott Pilgrim controversy? I did not. If so, then just prove to me that Netflix can't be trusted when it comes to IPs. Oh, well, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you didn't need something like that to prove it to you. Absolutely. I did not hear about that. I really liked the Scott Pilgrim movie that they did uh, over 10 years ago now, I guess. Um, but I hadn't really read the comic before that. I just really liked the movie and I haven't heard anything about it since then. So I have to look into that. Fazocho Corner. Welcome, welcome. Jose Fuentes. And so many more. Zaktan, DFLS Studios. Spidey Rules is here. Nice. Let's see. Many, many poor people. I'll go ahead and get to the content, or else I'll just sit here and, and welcome people all day, all night long. <laughs> but uh <clears throat> I just see Alec Purdue asked, what even is Scott Pilgrim? Scott Pilgrim, it was a um I don't think it was it wasn't manga, but it was like a manga inspired. The, the old comic comic that that kind of art style it looked like a little bit i don't know it would also had some i wasn't crazy about the art to be honest but apparently it was a comic book and it was very meta the story was very meta it was a very cool idea um and they did a wonderful movie with um oh, i'm blanking on his name the guy from uh super bad was also in um um I don't know. I'm, I'm blanking all these names right now. But anyway, it was good. Um, had a lot of people in that movie. Brandon Routh was in the film. Brie Larson was even in the film before she became Brie Larson. Um, Aubrey Plaza. So many good people were in that movie. It was fun. Michael Sarah. Thank you, guys. Michael Sarah. I knew somebody would, would remind me there. So today's tonight's topic. First of all, I am going to cover some reviews as part of tonight's stream a little bit. Uh, I finished Floating Dragon, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> I also finished um, Floating Dragon by Peter Straub. I also finished uh, Summer of Night by Dan Simmons. And I finished book two of Joe Frankenstein, great Graham Nolan, uh, Chuck Dixon book. So talk about those. I also recently finished, you know, I mentioned in uh, a couple 
weeks ago or a stream or two ago that I had been watching the Sleepy Hollow series that they did, you know, in the teens, 2000 teens, and knew it wasn't going to be stellar, you know, because of the time it was done in. But I, I wanted to watch it because, uh, you know, it's part of my scholarship for Sleepy Hollow, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. You know, I've taught that story, and, and that's kind of the one iteration that I hadn't, you know, given a chance to yet. And uh, really liked a lot of aspects of it, really did. But it was just riddled with problems that came from the producers. You could just see that. It trickled right down from the producers. And it got me to thinking about some of the problems in writing, you know, um, like one of the, some of the problems in the Sleepy Hollow series was it started out with such a cool idea, such a cool idea. But they never really gave any of the ideas time to breathe, time to develop, time to really, you know, let's ride this out and see how the cool this idea could develop into. Even by the second season, they were just like, you, and you could almost see the producers behind the screen. What we change that up? How about we throw that in? And um, let's, let's change that up and throw that in. And just like, got to shake things up. Got to get them viewers, you know, or whatever. And it just, the, the story started to tank, you know, and even you still had a great cast and still had a lot of great ideas within it. And it took a long time for it to go all the way down. Uh, Tom Misson and John Noble just made that show amazing in terms of, of just presence, you know, and, and um, acting. But the story just had so many problems with it to the point that by the end, even though, you know, by the end of the fourth season, they had to change up cast left or whatever, but they had a pretty cool idea, a pretty cool thing going by the end of that. But then that was, you know, too late for that to catch on for anything to be renewed but it got me thinking about some of the problems that that people have with writing and you know in the in the case of the tv series it's kind of from the producers meddling you know i don't know maybe some of the writers were having these issues too or these dumb ideas but it was kind of you know part of the producers meddling but in watching that in conjunction with reading these novels it made me think of some of the problems that a lot of writers have. And I got to thinking about some of the writers today, you know, a lot of us, a lot of you listening to the channel, you know, are trying to do your own um, works, your own comic books, our own stories, you know, one day. And that's great. That's wonderful. It's to be encouraged in every way. But with this new culture that we have with this new, all the opportunities with the technology that we have, on the one hand, it's a good thing that we remove the, the gatekeepers of like the big publishing industry. That's a good thing. But they did serve a purpose. Maybe not the actual publishing industries, but the, that whole setup back then, you know, the gatekeeping, so to speak, on its most basic level did serve a pretty good purpose of quality control. We're not going to, you know, the companies weren't going to pour their assets and resources into something that they didn't feel was of a certain level of quality, you know, that, that would make them money. That's how it should work anyway. Of course, there was politics involved and all that kind of stuff. And it just became a, a crap show. But now with the technology there, you don't need a big company's resources. You know, it, it can be pretty expensive, inexpensively done. I mean, you know, that you can do the big crowdfunding route, uh, but you can even just straight up publish your own thing on Amazon, you know, it, it's uh, print on demand isn't even a naughty word anymore. You know, it doesn't have a stigma attached to it. Self-publishing isn't even a stigmatized you know thing anymore in the culture and technology we live in. But the problem with that is that a lot of new writers are encouraged by that to just get their stuff out there stat. And they end up with really subpar stories. Not that their ideas were bad. Their ideas might've been wonderful. They might've had all the passion for it in the world, but the current system of technology and their current culture of being able to just get things out and find an audience anywhere really discourages you or doesn't give you any incentive to slow down and take the time to learn how to write first. And I say not only learn how to write, but learn how to edit. And that is every bit as important. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit, and then I'll segue into the reviews of these books because the novels in particular. Um, though I did enjoy, I'll say it's flat out, I really did enjoy Floating Dragon and Summer of Night. Uh, there were some problems with both of them that I thought just shouldn't have been problems with these. Now, Peter Straub, this was written in like 80s and then Summer of Night, I think, came out in maybe 2011 or something like that. So it's not quite the same thing as just new, new writers trying to, you know, make a name for themselves. But um, anyway, the importance of, of learning how to write. So you know, we can talk about that in the abstract, 
and you can even pick up some things, you know, you, you can go on some writing channels or whatever, and you can start learning the right terminology. You can, you know, throw around words like pacing, intention, or character development, and that's all well and good. But really learning how to apply it, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like being a musician. This is a great analogy. I've been thinking about this a lot because Sound Engraver is always talking about, you know, in our conversations, she's always talking about music and, and the importance of practicing and so forth. You know, with music, there's the head knowledge that you have to learn uh, if you're going to be a real serious musician. You know, you do have to learn musical theory. You have to learn the notes and the chords and how it all goes together and what, you know, if, if it's in this key, what that means. I mean, you just kind of have to know that. That's sort of some book knowledge you have to have. But then depending on which instrument you have, there's a whole other knowledge of application. You know, Sound Engraver has to know how to, you know, she had to learn how to approach the violin. She's always talking to me about, you know, her students and everything and how she often to teach them to sit a certain way. Nope, you're holding it the wrong way. No, you need to do this. No, when you're, um, you know, you imagine the bow on the strings, it's just, it's such a big deal. Violin in particular is such a big deal, you know, from something like piano where the sound is kind of ready made. But I remember even from my days playing bass, you know, I mean, you had to, uh, you know, you had to, to play the bass a certain way. Your fingers had to be off the frets. You couldn't have buzz. You had to, to watch those, you know, open notes that just, you know, go crazy. And all that's separate from the head knowledge. You know, you can know about keys. You can know about music theory. But the application of it on actually playing the instrument is a totally different thing. All right. So how does that apply to writing? Well, you can go on all these channels and you can hear about pacing, uh, sentence variety, good, clean prose. You can hear about all these things, plot, you know, analysis, outline. You can hear about all of that. And maybe you can even kind of understand it in the abstract, and that's good. But it takes a long, long time, more time than a lot of new writers want to hear that it takes to really learn that innately when it comes to the application of writing your own stories. It just does. It's just something you have to accept. There's a great quote by Ira Plato that I know a lot of you have, have read before, but when he talks about, look, when you're starting out as a writer, you need to realize that you suck and that you're going to suck for a long time. Now, I mean, he doesn't use that word suck, but um, it's a hard truth. And But what he says, though, he says, now, it doesn't mean that you're bad and you should never be doing this. What you need to hold on to is your taste. And I would even translate that as your ideas. You can have the coolest ideas ever. That's you. That's coming from your own personal psyche. Nobody else can come up with the things that you individually can come up with. So hold on to that because that if you're if you're serious about being a writer and if you really want to get these stories out there one day, then that's what you need to translate one day. The the learning how to write and the 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 practice and the getting the the actual um you know, experience behind you of writing it out is just there to help you translate and, and express this wonderful, unique vision that you have. And that's what you need to hold on to. But you need to realize that it's not about really, you know, just writing a lot every day for a year and then you're ready to publish, you know, not necessarily. So you have to learn to write. And the best way to learn how to apply the craft of writing. And I know that not everybody here is a writer, but even those of you who aren't necessarily writers or don't want to write stories, I know you all enjoy stories or you wouldn't be here on my channel. You can still get a lot from what Adam, what, what I'm saying about how to judge these stories, you know, in the media and books and so forth, because it's, it's pretty uh, applicable. You have to the, the best way to learn the application of writing it's like a disconnect in your mind. You can know these things in your head about clean prose, you know, uh, plotting, tension, all of that, character development, character arcs. You can know all of that, but when you're writing your own story, it's very hard to think about those things that you know in the abstract and applying them to your own story. You get better at it and you keep going with it, but that's why everybody needs an editor. Everybody needs an editor. Even writers who are really got this down, they need an editor because it's just so hard to look at your reading or look at your writing as the reader would. But the best way to get there, the best way to make progress in that is to practice editing. Practice editing. Start reading the stories you read with a real active eye. The best way to do it is to get involved in a workshop. You know, a lot of popular writers, Stephen King kind of famously said this in his own um, book on writing. 
and other popular writers have done this too, where they scoff at, you know, oh, you don't have to go learn to be a writer. Rawr, you don't need to take classes. You don't need to, no, you don't. You just need to write. Um, well, good for you, little Mr. Pie in the Sky, Stephen King, who can, you know, pull a story out of your butt every month and, and get it published. And there's no question it's going to be published. But that's just simply not true. There's a lot of merit, a lot of merit to learning how to write, to going and taking classes. Now, you can find some crap classes, of course, that aren't very good and well done. But there's a lot of merit to that. That's not to say that everybody needs to go take classes on writing or, or get a degree in it like I did or anything like that. Of course not. But you need to approach it seriously as a trade, as a craft. And that means that it needs to be studied and it needs to, you need to seek out mentors. You need to seek out, at the very least, a writing group. Grab some friends or friends online or whatever, some friends that, that want to uh, put their stories out too, you know, friends that you trust. And who are about the same level of you, you know, get a couple people even more, uh, you know, more skilled than you are and get a workshop going. I remember, you know, I, I offer editing services. And when I do, a lot of people take me up on that. But I offered a workshop service one time. <laughs> Hardly anybody wanted to do that because, no, I just wanted you to say pretty things about my writing. Prof. I didn't want to workshop and hear from a bunch of different people. Well, that's the best way to, to do it. It's the best way to do it because not only do you hear feedback about your a lot of different varied feedback about your, your writing, but you also get the practice of, of looking critically at other people's writing. And that's the best way, you know, to, to, to practice editing your own writing, you need the practice of editing other people's. Um, it's the best way to bridge that gap between your subconscious mind and, and conscious mind. So it's really important. Now, What do I want to start with here? Let me start with with uh, Children of the Night. I don't have that's that's one that I listen to as an audiobook, so I don't have a hard copy to show you here. <clears throat> but um, I'm sorry, not Children of Night, Summer of Night. I'm reading his second. He he apparently Dan Simmons. See, I I should say this too. This is going to color my review a little bit. But the reason I found uh, I even stumbled across Summer of Night. It's a horror novel by Dan Simmons. Is that I was looking for books that were similar to it, not necessarily copies of it, but books that dealt with that same similar theme. This is how you know a scholar works. When you get kind of obsessed with an idea or something that you really want to uh, study, you want to go out there and find all the incarnations of it. You know, and, and especially from a cultural studies aspect, like I do, you know, you really want to find study where where how this idea expresses itself in different contexts or in different uh, people's art and whatnot and i just love the idea of it stephen king's it that idea as he says you know sort of the billy goats gruff you know the idea of the troll underneath a community you know and and uh, and, and there's a lot more to that the group of kids who who have this sort of bond between them and there are some some forces of good that are kind of imbuing these kids with this um, power to fight this, this, you know, it, you know, beneath the, the city and whatnot. Now I know that after, especially after reading floating dragon, Stephen King just ripped off a ton of things <laughs> from floating dragon. Uh, but I'll say he actually, if you had to tell him, if, if you put both books together and, and I had to choose one, which was done better, I would say it. Um, and there are reasons for that, that I'll go in. Well, maybe we'll start with um, floating dragon since I mentioned that, but that's how I stumbled across children are summer of darkness too. Um, or Summer of Night, I'm sorry, I keep getting the name all kinds of wrong, <laughs> because Dan Simmons wrote a trilogy of these horror novels that deal with some of the same characters across the three of them, maybe more, but these three are what I know of, and it starts with The Summer of Night, and the second one is Children of the Night that I'm currently listening to on Audible now. But, uh, you know, you can go back to some of these fairy tales, you can go back to children's tales like Billy Goes Gruff or something like that for this, but... Peter Straub's Floating Dragon. I'd heard about it, you know, once I read it and I loved it. And I heard that Peter Straub Floating Dragon was a similar story with a similar kind of concept and that Stephen King had pulled a lot from it. And he really did pull a lot from this. Uh, this is not available unabridged on audio. You do have to read it. Um, nice big novel, but it's a good read. Definitely read it. Um, I've got an old, old copy uh, that I found. It's like an old library copy, but I just laminated it and rolled with it. So I do recommend it. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. And Peter Straub, as I've said before, he's kind of been described as the thinking man, Stephen King. And sometimes that works well for him. It worked well for him with Ghost Story. Ghost Story is a phenomenal novel. Oh, man, it's just so good. I always um, recommend that. And he's written some other novels that I read by him that are just really, really good. 
he won't bother taking the time, which I think is good. I don't think you need to. He writes for a smarter reader. Like there's a there's a um there's a character, I'm not gonna probably any spoilers, but there's a character in Floating Dragon, a number of characters, so it's not really telling you anything, but there's a character in Floating Dragon who's kind of um not obsessed, but a part of his story and arc is he had a missing, an absent father. And going and looking after father figures was kind of a thing in his life, in his childhood and whatnot. And always wondering what happened to his father and wanting to know more about his father. Would his father have been proud of him and so forth? And there's a scene in the novel at one point in which he's got his son, his infant son, and he's at a cafe and he he just know he sees his father. He sees his father. He knows that's his father. And he walks up to the man. And I'm not going to say any names or whatever, but he says, you know, if, if the man's name is John Smith, he named his son after this after this absent father that he had. And he walks up to the man and said, John Smith, meet John Smith. You know, and that would have been a really cool way of like, oh, my gosh, you're my son. Oh, my gosh, that's my grandson. You know, it would have been a great scene. But in the very next second after he says that, he realizes, oh, this isn't my father. You don't even look like my father anymore. That must have all been in my head. And then he just moves on. And, you know, a a. a, a a writer less inclined to think through the themes of the story might just look at that scene and go so random. What, what, do you, what does that even mean? Well, it's, it's very obvious what it means. If you've read the story attentively and looked at the themes, it's a great cap on this character's story arc because he's been chasing after his father, the idea of his father and trying and, and find father figures and other characters and really trying to see, you know, does he, does he measure up? Would he be, would this father that he'd never had be proud of him and so forth? And in that moment where he's literally saying, hey, John Smith, meet John Smith, you know, um, basically showing that he named his son uh, after his father. He's also, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't like point to the grandson or anything. So he's also basically saying, I'm you. I did the father thing that you didn't. You had a child, never raised him. I've got a child here. Meet the real John Smith right here. Meet the real father here. You know, it's, it's and it's, it, there are more to it. There's more to it in the book like that, but you'd have to really kind of read the story to get that. And if you're thinking about it through the themes, it was very powerful. I was like, that is so cool. That's a great little scene. And I would have been insulted if he'd have taken the time to explain it to me more, like with some, you know, interiority of the character and so forth. Like, no, come on. This, um, you know, so he's, he's, he's a great writer in that respect. He really does, he really does, um, he doesn't fill in gaps that you should be reading alertively and attentively enough to, to fill in yourself. Alec Purdue for the super chat. Thank you so much there. So for $2, what qualifies as a ripoff and what's inspiration? That's a really great question. A really great, great question. And, and on some levels, floating dragon could just be an inspiration for it. You know, the, the idea of a, of a city or a community, a little town with an evil generational evil from within that's not copyrighted, you know, that that's something as old as folklore and whatnot. So that that's, you know, it's very easy to see how it was inspired by that. But there are specific aspects to it. Um, the, the, the fact that uh, one of the one of the there, there's a little group of individuals, they're not all kids in Floating Dragon, but a group of individuals who come together and they find that they just have this unexplainable bond to fight this thing. And one of them is really, really good at directions and, and navigating and the thing ends with them being under the town and one of them has to navigate and direct to get out of the town. Um, you know, there are a lot of little things like that that you can just see Stephen King directly <laughs> yanked off from one character in this book and put it onto his character in another book. That's just one example, but there are a number of different things like that. Um, I mean, they're friends, you know, they co-write author, they co-author novels together. So it's not like, um, you know, there's legal trouble or anything like that. And, and maybe Straub wouldn't have even called it rip off. But as a writer or as a reader, I'm looking at it and going, eh, that crosses the line from inspiration to straight up <laughs> stealing an idea. Come on. So um, that's a good question, though. It is. DFLS Studios for five dollars. Thank you, sir. So do you think there is similar themes of it in Five Nights at Freddy's? I know nothing of Five Nights at Freddy's other than the basic premise, like stuck at Chuck E. Cheese overnight and the animatronics come alive and try to kill you. That's all I know. I know it's a movie. It's a it's a big horror film movie now that a lot of people are excited about. Apparently, it's it's done well. Apparently, it's what fans wanted. Um, I'm not a horror fan for the sake of horror. Uh, the only time I read horror stories like these is because I really like good versus evil stories. And I like it recontextualized to really teach us something about the nature of good versus evil. I like the timeless stories like that. 
as it is, you know. So I'm not really into slasher movies. Um, I love the original Halloween film. Don't really give a crap about any of the other ones. <laughs> I'm not really into other slasher films, you know. So that's just that's so um that's why I might I wouldn't know so much about Five Nights at Freddy's. I know it started out as like a sort of a kids game, maybe I don't know. But apparently, I'm hearing good things about it, and I'm glad that people are able to enjoy it. I have nothing against it, but yeah, unfortunately, I just can't answer your question too much because I don't know about that. But thank you. I said that's your first super chat on the live stream, so appreciate that. Your first super chat on a live stream. Does that mean this is your first super chat ever? That's pretty. I'm honored that you would uh, super chat me. I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer to your question in your first super chat ever. But uh, but good to see you there. Thanks for um. Thanks for the support and thanks for the question. Somebody else answer him in the chat or you guys tell me. I'll go back and look at the comments here in a bit. Um, you know, do you guys think it, you know, what do you think about it versus Five Nights at Freddy's? Five Nights at Freddy's, yeah. I don't know. So, um, and maybe I'll check it out. I don't know anything about it. So maybe it's not crazy slasher. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's fun. Maybe it is sort of good versus evil, you know? Like I said, I know nothing about it, so I can give it a go. But uh, Floating Dragon, I used it as an example when I was talking about characterization last time. And I said that it's possible if you have really good characterization, if a reader is really having fun spending time with the characters you've created and spending time in the universe that you've created with them. That's great. And sometimes that can even cut you some slack, even if your plot is a little bit, eh, or the tension starts to lag or whatever. And that's the case with, with Floating Dragon. As I said, it's not, I really was expecting ghost story levels of quality. It's not ghost story levels of quality, but you do love the characters so much. It takes a while to find those characters, though. Now, when I come across a book like this, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's part of my scholarship, right? I'm, I'm reading Floating Dragon for enjoyment, but it's not just for enjoyment. It's not just a summer read or something I'm picking up just because I want to enjoy it. If I had been a book I was picking up just to see if I enjoyed it, I would have put it down. Because you go a long ways into the book before you even know who your main characters are. It's one of those books, and Summer of Night by Dan Simmons does this too, where he wants to just like drop a crap ton of exposition about this city on you first. And that's really bad writing. And that's something that thankfully Stephen King didn't do with it. You know, he took all these cool ideas and he started with actual scenes, actual characters, actual stakes, you know, and, and it was, you got that little scene of uh dairy at the beginning, sort of in the eighties in the modern time, when the time was novel was written, you know, where like the one, the gay guy gets, you know, um, eaten by it. But it's not very soon after that. That's just sort of a setup. That's just sort of a hook to get you, you know, knowing this monster, what's the mystery. And then you are introduced to some of your main characters and you grow to love those main characters. I mean, when you read it, you really do. Uh, you're going to find yourself in one or more of those kids, these adults remembering themselves being kids and whatnot. And it's, uh, you know, Stephen King does that when he's on. Stephen King can do that very well, really writing uh, about real humanity and uh you know, as he says, you know, good fiction is the truth inside the lie. You know, you're writing about fantastical things, sure, but you're you got to tell the truth. You got to really, you know, bring out the truth of humanity within these characters. And Stephen King can do that well. Um, he's so prolific. He's one of those writers who's so prolific that he just doesn't do it in a lot of his book work because you just can't you can't hit that level of quality when you're churning out a book a month, you know, so to speak. Not that he literally does that, but you know what I mean. But he does that in it. So I and I didn't quite. Um, or I did see the characters in Floating Dragon. Once, once, once we finally get to the characters and I finally know, okay, these are the ones that we're supposed to be following, it's a lot of fun. But it takes a long time to get there. So if you're going to pick up Floating Dragon, just know that. You're going to have to sift through. And I mean, it's interesting history of the place. It's not boring. But I'm the kind of reader that I like to know who I'm supposed to be investing in. I want to know that early. I don't want to read a history of your city before I get to your story. Even if you're kind of building the story through the history, no, give me somebody to root for. Give me somebody to follow, you know? And uh, and you don't know that. And it's just like people that you think you're maybe supposed to follow up and die, you know, all of a sudden. And eventually you get to your core and then it's fun. It's a lot of fun to follow those. And then you can go back and get a little bit of history from it. And that's great. Uh, one thing Peter Straub does a lot in his novels 
is he really plays with the meta uh, narrative. You know, um, there's a one of the main characters is actually writing this book. He's like the actual narrator, but he's writing it in third person narration. But occasionally he'll say, OK, I'm breaking in now. I'm going to write this next part in my own voice because, you know, it's really important. There's only way I can describe what happened next is to do it in my own voice or whatever, you know. So um, but this main character writing in third person allows him to have done the research after the fact, and he can go and tell you what so-and-so was thinking when this happened to them alone in their house and so forth, you know? So it's, uh, it's, it's good. It, it, it carries his kind of meta <clears throat> approach to narrative. You know, it's got that has great characters, but the ending, the whole setup, and this is something that summer of night did by Dan Simmons as well. You've got a reason, you know who the monster is. We have a basic reason, but it doesn't feel fully fleshed out. It doesn't feel fully explained. How exactly does this person slash entity, whatever, I don't want to give it away, so I'm just going to be very vague in my terminology. How does this monster get the power they had? What is even their real motivation? The motivation that I can glean from Floating Dragon for this monster is very, very thin very thin. I don't understand the monster at all. Now in it, it's clear. You've got this sort of Lovecraftian entity, ancient entity from space, you know, who's just there to consume and devour. And, and that works. It's more of an elemental evil. And that's fine. You don't need a character motivation for Pennywise, you know, beyond that, if it's that kind of villain, fine. But even in it, you, you knew more about what Pennywise's machinations were, why every so years that it surfaces, um, how it goes about, what it specifically feeds on and so forth, you know? Floating Dragon really didn't have that. Uh, it didn't have some good uh, flushing out of the monster. It didn't even, it was a cool way. The ending, the the big battle is cool at the end, but even that, I'd like to little know a little bit more about why. You know, wait, wait, well, why though? Why? You know, when the kids in It go down to the sewers, it's satisfying and you find out they don't quite kill it, you know? So when the adults have to go back, it's still satisfying there. You know, you know how they fight Pennywise at the end of it makes perfect sense. Not like the crap movie did. The movie was so stupid. This is another problem with that idiotic movie. You know, the ones that were recently done the, the 1990 miniseries, pretty, pretty darn well done. Um, you know, for a 1990 TV series, miniseries, but, uh, but the crap ones they put out in theaters, it's just dumb. I think the first one just had the kids like yelling insults at Pennywise at the end. And that hurt him because it took away his power. I'm like, what? It's like the ABC story of the week or something. Now, suddenly it was just dumb. But um, so yeah, Floating Dragon didn't really didn't really deliver on that front. I do like it. I don't I'm not crapping on it all altogether. I really like the story. I think there's a lot of great things. If you like Stephen King's It pick up floating dragon. There's a lot of good things in it. You, you get Peter Straub's very literary minded. So he's going to make a lot of illusions and come up with this sort of, you know, um, invented history, you know, that's a lot of fun. And like I said, he's really good at themes and, and character development and, and a lot of really cool things go on in the book. Definitely. But I just think that because he's so, uh, what's the word? He's so nebulous about some of the ideas that he's not really paying attention to, to laying out the common plot, you know, the, 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 the foundation of it that we need. Um, so I could say more, but that's basically floating dragon. I just, you know, you guys like when I give reviews and things that I'm reading, I do. If, if you liked Stephen King's it, if you've read the novel, Stephen King's it, if all you've ever done is watch movie Stephen King's it, I don't really know if you'd like floating dragon. If you can actually tackle the reading of Stephen King's It, which is a big book, and you enjoyed it, then you will like Floating Dragon. You might have some of the similar problems I have with it, but you will like it. A couple super chats here let me get to before I miss them. Uh, Owen Lister says, I know reading good books can also help you with improving writing. Absolutely, for your own story. I'm currently reading some short pulp stories like Solomon Kane, hoping it will help me improve as a writer. You're absolutely right. Now, with pulp stories, especially like Robert E. Howard, you know, so Solomon Kane, these are, you need to understand, I'm sure you do, but one needs to understand that these are pulp stories. These are not literary fictions. And I don't mean that in a snobby way because Robert E. Howard is amazing, you know? Um, and you can really glean a lot from, you know, like Edgar Rice Burroughs too. There's so much fun 
that they capture in those stories. And you can really read that and try to glean from that. What you don't want to do is you don't want to learn how to be a prose stylist from like Edgar Rice Burroughs. <laughs> his prose is awful. <laughs> but you, you just you, you know that when you read his novels, you're like, I'm not here to learn how to construct sentences and get a good prose flow. I'm here to really learn how to capture the fun of the story like he did. You know, um, that's great. So. Uh, so, yeah, pulp stories are, are great, too, if, if that's the kind of stories you want to write. But just make sure that you know what you're wanting to glean from them. You, you know, don't learn the wrong lessons because some of them weren't so great at certain aspects of writing. Uh, DFLS Studios, uh, thank you so much. Said, what is a meta story and meta narrative? What I mean by that is, um, yeah, that word meta is kind of thrown around a lot today to the point where it doesn't really mean much or it's, um, it doesn't always mean what it should mean. Meta is sort of, um, you know, think about metaphysics, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the study of existence itself, you know? So if a story is kind of meta, think about Scream. I don't know if you saw the first Scream movie or any of the Scream movies. You know, Scream is a horror film and the characters in the film kind of know they're in a horror film, right? They're like, oh my gosh, this happened, that happened. Okay, well, in the movies, here are the rules. If you do this, you die. If you have sex, you die. If you do that, you know, and that that was meta. It was kind of like a self-awareness almost to the to the to this characters in the movie. Now, it doesn't always have to be the characters themselves who are self-aware. It can just be that the 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 prose itself is sort of self-aware. Like um Watchmen, the actual graphic novel Watchmen is, is kind of a meta narrative in a lot of ways because he's playing with the different levels of narration. He's telling you the story, not only with the panels and comic panels, but there's also news clippings. There's, um, um, I think, scrapbook, you know, from different characters, you know, so you're so you're thinking, OK, well, how trustworthy are these different levels of narration that I'm getting? You know, do I really trust that uh, that? journalist that wrote that article because some of the things in Watchmen are, are skewed, you know, by the media. Uh, do I really trust this one character and their reminiscences, you know, because you jump from that and then back to a third person omniscient, you know, for just for the actual comic panel, supposedly. So it's kind of playing with the idea, you know, it's when a story really, and I enjoy that as a writer and a reader, I enjoy that you can do it poorly and you can do it too much. Um, you know, on a silly level, it's kind of the same thing as Deadpool breaking the fourth wall. You know, it's kind of meta, you know, but you can do it in a very literary way, which I think Straub does quite a bit in his books. Um, <clears throat> let me, before I jump into uh, the chat a little bit more, let me just cover Summer of Night because that's that's a good follow up to talking about uh, um, Floating Dragon. Because again, Summer of Night came across my radar just looking up book lists where people said this book or that book was is sort of similar to Stephen King's it. And I actually downloaded it, bought it on audible before I even realized the author, Dan Simmons. And then I realized, Oh, Dan Simmons of Hyperion infamy. Cause I didn't read Hyperion, but, but Sound Engraver did. And she had a lot of problems with it. And she was telling me about it the whole time she was reading it. And it's just not, it didn't sound like anything I'd be interested in whatsoever. Uh, but she had said, you know, some people said that his horror is better than his science fiction. So give that a try. So I am. I, I did. And and I'm glad I did. I liked Summer of Night, too. Like Floating Dragon. I liked it. But um, but but there's some issues with it. In uh, Sound Engraver, just to share one of her comments here, she said, Dan Simmons is quite indulgent with his novels. He can write short stories very well. He's to the point and horrifying. And, you know, that's a really good observation about Dan Simmons. I agree with you, my dear, because one of the things I've noticed in Summer of Night, but also in Children of Night, the second book I'm reading now, is that he can write, he can get you in a scene so well. Like there's a scene in Children of Night, the second book I'm reading now, where this woman's trying to adopt this infant baby uh, from Romania in like 89, you know, so still, you know, or, or during the Soviet era still or right towards the end of it. And she's trying to adopt this child and uh, she's in the airport and she is like this, the security officers and it's like, is she going to make it out? Is she going to get on the plane? Are they going to, you know, what, what's going to happen? It's very tense. And they're like, man, I'm so wrapped up in the scene right now. It's really good. But then he turns around and spends like way too long. Like I'm just getting sick of these scenes where he's just like glorying in the fact that he's trying to take vampirism in children of night and, and make it like a, hard science fiction 
with medical terminology. Like this is the hard medical science of how vampirism would work. I don't care. I don't care. You didn't tell me I had to be a med student to care about this book. And there's just like so many long stinking diatribes and characters going off about all these explanations. I don't care. I accept it. I'm reading a vampire novel. Yeah. And it medically sort of makes sense. Whatever. Get on with the scene, get on with the characters, get on with the plot. And, uh, and he did that in summer of night too. Summer of Night really hooked me. Again, it takes a long, he, he starts with a big exposition dump of the history of the town in this school building and blah, 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 blah. And he finally gets to some characters. And it takes me a while too to really even kind of learn which characters are going to be my core characters that I follow because you can only have so many characters. And it is a group of young boys who are kind of um, see themselves as the bike patrol it's set in 1960 and uh, outside of Des Moines. I think, but it's, um, it's really good. The characters that he develops are so awesome. You really like these characters and you, you'll have your favorite or whatever. He didn't really tick me off. Uh, one character does die. Well, a lot of people die. It's a horror novel, but one character that I really liked that I was like, Oh, this character is so awesome. Ends up dying. And I'm just, Oh, didn't want to forgive him for that. But he made me forgive him because some of the other characters that I hadn't quite bonded with, I ended up bonding with, you know, after that. So it was really, um, the characters are so great. You want to spend time with them. But again, same, same um, complaint that I had with Peter Straub's floating dragon, but even more so for Dan Simmons summer of night is that he doesn't really flesh out what this threat is. You know, sort of what it is. It's got some, some, um, and I'm not going to give everything away, but he brings up some, you know, you go back to the Borgias in, in Italy and, cursed objects i won't give anything away because if you want to read the novel yourself i won't give anything away but cursed objects making their way across you know the ocean to the new world and so forth that's all interesting that's great but then somehow like osiris is mentioned at one point which is fine but develop it but then they're never mentioned again and i'm like well you can't just say um ancient evil thing from europey stuff and that's what's happened that's the bad guy no i need more than that you know, again, really tell me, you know, is it a purely elemental Lovecraftian evil like in it? But if you have human involvement in it, like both Floating Dragon and uh, Summer of Night did, then you need to flesh that out more. You need to tell me more about uh, the humans involved. What are their motivations? Because humans are going to have some motivations and, and it's um, it needed a lot more of that. The ending to it was really or the, 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 the resolution to the good versus evil was really unsatisfying, really unsatisfying. Um, I mean, it turned out the way I wanted it to turn out, but it just, it just, it felt like, and apparently from what sound engravers told me and from some reviews I've seen of his other stuff, this is, this is the case with a lot of Dan Simmons work. It's like his interest in the novel that he's writing ebbs and flows as he's writing it. You know, you know, and when he's interested, he's writing really cool stuff that gets you interested. But then some of it just feels phoned in. And then when he's interested in it, he doesn't go back and rewrite the phoned in stuff. He just keeps rolling from there or something. That's how it feels as a writer. I don't know if that's the process. But that's very much how it feels. Now, there is a character um, I did appreciate. I didn't know. And I was asking Sound Engraver because she'd read Hyperion. It's a really, I think, a great representation of the catholic church in this um you know horror novel summer of night i thought it was really great um she said he's not that charitable or that kind to the catholic church at all in hyperion um uh, but one of the characters you know um shows up again in summer of night as a priest you know much older you know in the late 80s and uh so far i'm, I'm pretty impressed by it because I, I mean you know as a catholic myself and you don't have to be catholic to you get this i just don't like um I don't like two dimension, two dimensional bullying of religions, even as a Catholic, if it's, if it's doing the same thing to, um, you know, Muslims or, or something that I would have a great deal of issues with in terms of their belief system. I still don't like a two dimensional unfair representation of it. If you're going to use that approach to ostracize or pillory them, you know, um, that, that takes me out of the story. And, uh, and so far he hadn't done that, you know, in, in what I've read of it, but, uh, summer of night, another, if you've liked it, that's that's unabridged on audible and it's uh it's a fun read it's a good narrator um i would have read that cover to cover if i wasn't trying to finish up floating dragon cover to cover as i was reading that so um 
so I so I picked it up on Audible and I picked up the next one on Audible because I'm doing some Star Wars um, hardcover reading right now as well. So those are the two reviews. Um, and again, those aren't reviews, reviews like you'd get, you know, this is my beginning to end, you know, I'm a professional book reviewer. No, I'm just telling you what I thought about them. And in terms of the way I was thinking about them, which is approaching them as novels that are sort of like it. I'm just looking for some more stories like that. It's kind of what I'm studying right now, you know. Um, and as a scholar, you study that with primary text first. And you really have to really pour over the primary text and give that its due. And you can look at secondary text as well. Some of the scholarship that's been reading, written about it. But you need to take that with a grain of salt because you got a bunch of idiotic you know, political activists writing that nonsense. Got a super chat from Andre Hernandez. Thank you so much. Said, curious about your thoughts as an editor. I recommend a shonen manga anime, Bakuman, if I'm pronouncing that right. A story about two boys that want to write manga and find an editor and have arguments about how they write. <laughs> Seems like it's a weird topic for a manga or anime, uh, unless there's more to it, unless it's like fantastical elements or something. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure that would be, uh, I'm sure that would be of interest to me, you know, um, <laughs> writers talking to an editor and, and having arguments about their stories and whatnot. Yeah, I, I, um, I haven't heard about that. I'll, um, if I can remember the name, I'll have to, to look it up later. Bakuman. Interesting. Yeah, it is, it is fun to, to, that's another meta thing you can do, you know, when, when your characters in your story or the story itself is about writing and editing. That was pretty good. Um. There was a really good movie. I watched uh, watched it for a class because we were studying this. I can't remember what the name of it was. You guys might remember. It had Will Ferrell, believe it or not, Will Ferrell, um, Emma Thompson, Queen Latifah was even in it, Dustin Hoffman. What was it called? But it was about this guy who starts to hear narration in his head this voice narrating the things he's doing in his life. And he thinks he's schizophrenic. What's happening. But it turns out that uh, he's a character. He realizes that he's a character in this novelist's book. And this novelist is writing the current book right now of which he's a character in stranger than fiction. I think that's the name of it. Stranger than fiction, but it's not like super fantasy. It's not like a, a an author in another dimension. And he's a no, he's just like, He's like a New Yorker or something, and, and he just walks in and suddenly he's hearing this narration and he real and he's a real person. He remembers his life. He's not like, you know, uh, you know, so it's really a good uh that's a good example of some really good meta work. Uh and it's a good movie. I, I liked I like the ending, I like the whole thing, so it was good. <clears throat> so moving along, just so I can make sure I get these reviews in, and then we'll then I can check my time and, and see what's up with the chat and stuff. But I did want to, <clears throat> because I said so, I would talk about Joe Frankenstein book number two. Now this isn't um, at all get off stream yards so that glare isn't on there. This isn't at all a um, I don't imagine a lot of people are, are waiting on my review of this because this was published in its entirety the whole however many parts there are two or three four or five or whatever they published the whole run of this with another publisher back in the day. Um, and it's Graham Nolan and Chuck Dixon, the story, of course, Graham Nolan's wonderful art, but they are republishing it now. Let me just read you the credits. It's created and co-written and illustrated by Graham Nolan, created and co-written by Chuck Dixon. Okay, so Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan both created it, and they both co-wrote it. But of course, Graham Nolan's doing the art. I forget the publisher that they did it under before, but they're republishing it now under Compass Comics, which is Graham Nolan's deal. And... They're republishing in their Compass Com Comics because it's going to be part of their shared comic universe with Compass Comics. They've got some books coming out, which I've got. I should be receiving my copy of Ghost to Matacumbe, which I'll definitely read and review. And I think um, he's bringing in his Monster Island and Return to Monster Island. That apparently is going to be part of this universe, too. And it's really cool. It's a, it's a monster universe. It's, it's very much the whole idea. And, and he's been interested in this stuff for a while. Uh, monster Island is, is a you know, call back to the land of the lost kind of stuff, you know, which was really great. I've done a review of both. I think both volumes of, of monster Island, they're really good. And uh ghost of Matacumbe looks like a very, you know, cool ghost story. I think it's set in like new Orleans or something like that. Joe Frankenstein is truly a love letter to the universal horror movies, but it's sort of like, what if these characters were set in a, superhero world or or more maybe like super spy world more of i don't know 
it's not like um when I say superhero world, it's not like uh, what's John Malin's um I forget the name of John Malin's you know work where he's like, what if the Universal Monsters were basically the X Men? You know, and that's a really cool approach too. But this is different than that. You know, as I set up in my volume one review, you've got Joe Frankenstein who is the descendant of Victor Frankenstein, and or I don't care if they call him Victor or Henry, but the original Doctor Frankenstein, and the creature, of course is the monster is monstrous, but he did fall in with, uh, with some monks and they taught him kind of brought his humanity out, taught him to make amends for his, you know, uh, the evils of his past. And he's been given the gift of immortality by Dr. Frankenstein. Doesn't know how, but in creating him, Dr. Frankenstein just was able to make him immortal. And he's gone through the years until like our modern times, watching over the descendants of Dr. Frankenstein because he killed Dr. Frankenstein. You know, so he's kind of doing that to make up for it. But it turns out that the bride, and this is all in the early, like few pages, exposition pages of volume one. So I'm not spoiling it for you. Even if you want to go read it from volume one, the bride of Frankenstein was created without that immortality gene. So she's been having to use some unnatural means like preying on others to, uh, to maintain her immortality. And she's got this whole underground network of like vampires and, you know, other monsters and whatever that are sort of this underground mafia like thing looking for the descendant of Victor Frankenstein, because apparently the descendant, you need his blood to unlock it. And then the key is in the monster's blood, the codex or whatever kind of thing. You know, if you want to think about it like that, I don't know um, the details there. I don't pay a lot of attention to the hard intricacies of the sciences or whatever. I just accept that. I have a very easy suspension of disbelief if you're telling me a good story and they absolutely tell a good story. I mentioned one or two small little issues I had with the first volume. Um, one or two little plot points that didn't didn't seem really fully thought out to me. It was kind of thin. I don't see anything like that in volume two. It feels like volume two is like they've laid the groundwork. They've gotten the ball rolling. Their characters have met. And now they're really jumping into the story they want to tell. And volume two was over before I knew it. I was really bummed. I was like, this is so much fun. There's a really cool Wolfman character. There's a cool mummy character. We even meet a Dracula character we don't know much about yet, um, but, but he's met in this volume too. Really great stuff. Of course, you've got Graham Nolan's amazing art. And he does try to add some extras into this Compass Comics version of the Joe Frankenstein that I, I don't think were in the original. Like he's got, you know, sketches and some um, stories about the character, you know, creations and stuff in the end. But just that art. I mean, you know, look at this here. Um, I have to put the brightness up in there. But uh just that art. I mean, um, the framing of it, the the panel design, you know, so many um, comic book artists drive me crazy when they try and cram so many panels onto a page. And Graham Nolan is not one of those. He knows how to do these things. You know, he knows how to lay it out so you can follow the story well. You, you The panels are big enough so that you can really enjoy the art. But, you know, not everybody. Um, I'm not saying I'm not. Don't I want to say that. Um We'll put it like that because it makes it sound like I'm comparing Graham Nolan to, to Tim Sale or something. And that's not really what I'm doing. But Tim Sale takes the approach of, you know, he and Jeff Loeb, especially when they do books together, there's like maybe three panels per a page because Tim Sale's art's so sweeping. And it's just like it tells the story on its own. Well, this story isn't supposed to be like that. It's not just told by the art. You know, they've got a good narrative going with the text as well. And, uh, and it meets a really good happy medium with that. So great artwork and just a solid story, solid story, uh, characters you care about. Uh, the creatures really, you know, Frankenstein's monster, somebody you really care about. There is a real element to um, Frankenstein Jr. It makes me think of that a lot. I'm sure, you know, even though they're going after like sort of a love letter to the, to the Universal Monsters, I'm sure somebody had to draw the connection of Frankenstein Jr., the old Hanna-Barbera, you know, short cartoon, because you've got this big, Frankenstein's monster and this kid, you know, um, you know, working with them and stuff. So it's really good. Uh, yeah, it's graphic novel. This is, um, part two, this is volume two. So, uh, I'm, I'm sure and maybe one day they'll put it all together as one huge graphic novel. It might even be out like that already from the other publisher, the previous publisher that it was out under, but I'm just reading it under compass comics. Cause I want to support what Graham Nolan and Chuck Dixon are doing now. And, uh, and I'm really enjoying it. So, um, it's taken a while for volume three to get out because they're just releasing it, you know, you know, ever so often is what I think it's Indiegogo, not Kickstarter on that one. Uh, he's used both, I think, <clears throat> but good stuff. I definitely recommend it. Uh, I definitely recommend Monster Island. I've got those. I've even got the big 
collector's edition of the first monster island which is like the huge hardback copy but i've done a review of that i'll put it in the uh in the uh, link it to the video there at some point later but i'm looking forward to ghost of matakumbe i want to see how that is um i haven't got my copy yet but i'm looking forward to that so yeah um it's good and it's uh it's, it's you know nolan and, and dixon they're they're creators that they're just tried and true you know you know they're going to be good you know, there. That's the thing about a lot of um, new writers who come about doing the crowdfunding route and trying to build a platform on YouTube. That's great, wonderful. But the ch the challenge they run into, Sound Engraver and I were I was telling this to Sound Engraver the other day, just kind of hypothetically speaking about it. Um, think about like Young Ripa, for example, enormously successful. It just it's mind boggling how successful he's been because he really put in the work to building a platform. He's, he's apparently a very great business mind, you know, whether you like him or hate him or whatever. I'm just, you know, objectively saying these things. He really knows his stuff about business. He built up an incredibly pro popular platform. And then when he was first doing his funding for ISIM, it uh, people were just falling over hand and fist to, to support him. And then as it became more of a story and more of a, a, you know, the thing to be talked about, then everybody wanted in on it. But here's the thing. Now, at some point, you have to ask yourself when you go that route. I haven't read Isom, so I, I really don't know. It might be a literary masterpiece for all I know. It might be total crap. I do not know. I haven't read it yet. Okay, so I have no, and I don't even suspect one way or the other. Okay, I, I just don't know. I'm making, I'm making any judgments. I'm just using him as an example because he's really super popular in this campaign that he did was super popular. <clears throat> I think he's maybe to the point now where he's doing the part two or he's got Chuck Dixon's writing for him and stuff like that. He's expanding his universe, which is great. But will young Rippa ever be known as a good writer, a great writer, or will he be known primarily as a YouTuber who had a popular crowdfunding campaign? You know, you think Chuck Dixon, you think great writer, you know, will, what is Isom so good? And if it is so good, it'll still take time, right? If, if Young Grippa's ideas and writing is so good that he will eventually be known as a good writer, primarily, then that will be, uh, that'll take time, right? Because he's primarily first known as, as a YouTuber in this platform there and stuff. That's fine. But anybody who, who wants to go that route, which is a perfectly valid route to take, build a platform, especially on YouTube, do crowdfunding or whatever, you've got to, to realize what do you really want to be known for? Your platform? Do you really want, and what I mean by that practically is do you want people to buy your book because they like your channel or do you want people to buy your book because they read your last book and it was really good you know i mean the best and, and the best compliment to a writer that goes this kind of crowdfunding like youtube route would be for somebody to pick up their th third second fourth book and not even really be watching their channel anymore they just really like their content really like their writing you know that's awesome and um uh, you know, who knows? I mean, when you got the industry professionals who are coming in, you know, Ethan Van Skyver kind of pioneered it, but he's somebody who'd worked in the comic industry for a long time before. And other ones, you know, came into the crowdfunding world from the comic industry. And these were people that had already made a name for themselves as comic creators, whether it be artists or writers or whatever. But for those people who are just getting their start and putting their stories out, you know, on this platform, you really have to ask yourself, where, where do you in? It's, it's not impossible to do. You can be uh, known as, as a really good creator, storyteller, writer, whatever, or artist or whatever, uh, and then have your, your social networking kind of done separately or whatever. But I think it's an easy trap for a lot of people to fall into just to play into the hype, uh, just to play into that clickbaiting, monetizing those haters and so forth. And then that's really kind of what you're doing for money. The books is just one way in which you've monetized your YouTube fame. And it's not really something that stands on its own merit as a, as a well-written story that people would want to seek out because it's a well-written story. You know, I don't know. It's just an interesting thought to think about. I think it poses, I think there are some challenges and some, some issues that, that writers who go this new route need to think about and need to kind of um, continue to balance and judge, you know, as they go along. So just interesting. Like I said, uh, again, I'm just using, Young Rippa as an example, because he's so popular. I haven't read his book yet. I know I like his YouTube channel a little bit. I don't watch YouTube channels much. I don't, I'm not a YouTuber in terms of a viewer much. If I go on YouTube, it's it's either religious content or like fun history content or retro, you know, Recollection Road. I like that channel and stuff like that. I don't really watch the uh, commentators on YouTube. So um, 
so I haven't watched a lot of Young Ripa, but I know that from what a lot of people have said that me and him apparently do agree on a lot of stuff. So uh, all the best to him. I was just using him as an example because he's a really popular one right now. All right. So um, I've talked a long time. Believe it or not, I'm about ready to wrap it up here. But I did just want to take a minute or two to go in to see some chats, uh, some people, you know, what you've been saying. Um, Spidey Rule says Stephen King is kind of guilty of taking jabs at Christians in his stories, even his good stories. Stephen King's a real toss up, you know. He's written so much garbage, but he's written occasionally really amazing things. Um, I said before, it was Insomnia that I wanted to read because I loved it so much. And Insomnia was also set in Derry. You know, Mike Canlan even you know, makes a, a appearance here and there. But all Insomnia was, was an excuse for him to make pro-lifers bad guys. Like pro-lifers were evil. And that's where this evil and this new evil in Derry is about the pro-lifers coming in. It was just like... Man, that's insulting to me as a reader. Not because I'm pro-life, but because like I expect more from you as a writer. You know, stop bringing your politics into writing a two-dimensional propaganda piece. You know, um, he's definitely in his public comments and whatnot. He is 100% crossed that line where he is there uh, to preach politics way more than he is to tell a story. But uh, not to say you still can't get some good stories. Funland was great. I read that. Um, you know, he's he's kind of a, a a gamble when you approach his books. Um, Eldritch fan, Spencer's Fairy Queen, straight anti-Catholic hate fest, but it was also a great work of genius and a forerunner to Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I mean, and now um, to say Spencer's Fairy Queen was a Catholic hate fest means a very different thing than to say somebody writing an anti-Catholic book today. Um, that's Anglicanism, early Anglicanism versus the Catholic Church, which are two things that look a lot more alike <laughs> than any anti-Catholic versus Catholic thing would look today. You know, it was more of a political power than actual differences in religion, you know, back then, because Anglicanism was basically Catholicism with a England flag stamped over our King Henry flag stamped over the Pope part, you know? So, um, and there were, there are changes developed, of course, sort but yeah, you're right. Um, the, the book itself is still so great. <clears throat> And yeah, uh, people love Lord of the Rings who aren't necessarily Catholic, even though Catholicism is 100% imbued into the DNA of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Jack Hammer says, I thought on whom the Satari was, as I always thought it was Darth Bane, as he lay the groundwork for what would cause the fall of the Jedi Rise of the Sith. I, You know, I think you're supposed to kind of think that, and you can still argue that when you're reading the Darth Bane trilogy. I, I would argue more that it is actually Palpatine, but um, but it's uh, it's a good discussion to have. It's good good talk to have. Uh, Owen Lister says another reason I'm sticking with pulp stories is because I'm not good at reading long novels. I'm a bit impatient, and reading short stories might help with that. That is a yeah, it's a really great. Um, that's a good uh, approach. You know, if you're not, if you don't have maybe the attention span to read a long, long form story, read short stories first. That's great. Uh, I wouldn't just limit yourself just to pulp stories though. Pulp stories are great. I love pulp stories. I have no problem with pulp stories, but um, try some good literary pulp uh, short stories as well. Look up um, Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, these are kind of my favorites, you know, Washington Irving and so forth, but they're really great short story writers uh, who, who are, a little bit more skilled at the writing chops overall than say some of the pulp writers. Again, not knocking pulp writers. I love it. But uh, but don't think you just have to seek out pulp stories. There are really good short stories. Um, heck, Stephen King's written some wonderful short stories. There are novellas, you know, that kind of thing, as has Neil Gaiman. Um, yeah. Good, good, but good, uh, good, good notion there to, you know, kind of build yourself up to it, definitely. Um <clears throat> Nathaniel Lozball says, Press Geek, the Godzilla movie is Japan-made. Okay, so it's not one of the, the Monarch kind of verse movies. It takes place at the tail end of World War II, bringing more of the tragedy and some horror along with the actions. It's subtitled, though. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. So another Godzilla uh, Toho movie, I guess? I don't know. <clears throat> All right. 
Well, I'm going to go ahead and call it a night because, as I say, I usually only have about an hour in me to do these streams, and I'm in an hour and 10 minutes, guys. Man, I'm, I'm wiped. <laughs> so uh going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, didn't really plan on, didn't know I would talk that long about my own topics there. I guess I just really had a lot to say about those books, though. I will try and cut those out. I have a video that I'm going to drop right now. As soon as I sign off, I'm going to, it's already been uploaded and everything. I just need to click it over from unlisted to public. But it's a cutout of last week's stream specifically in which I talk about the, um, you know, stories, how they just dissuade young boys from being selfless and, you know, growing into men, but specifically in terms of like the marvels and whatnot, young women or young girls, you know, being selfless and becoming women, you know, so that that's going to drop here as part of last night's our last week's stream. But thank you guys for watching. Appreciate it. I will be back next week. Of course. Um, think that, yeah, yeah. I'll be back next week. The holidays aren't going to mess that up. It's Saturday. So it's usual, usual plan. And uh, I'll have some other videos dropping throughout the week. Maybe I'll cut some of this out. Really appreciated chatting with everybody tonight. Sorry I didn't get into the chat a little bit more than I, as I usually do, but uh, we'll try and do that next week. So till next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the true blue, well-written stories you love best. Thanks for watching.